For when ancient man went traveling through the great culture area of the Mediterranean Aegean Sea, he was also a tourist seeking points of interest. And as a result of the common attitude of the time, seven great examples of early ingenuity and handicraft came to be recognized as the wonders of the ancient world. These wonders all come under the general collective concept of art architecture. They were monuments, structures erected by skilled craftsmen for various memorial purposes, and in the passing of time, are sanctified by the common applause of mankind. Of these ancient monuments, only one survives to the present time. And even in the earlier days, you had to have traveled at a rather strategic period in order to see all of them. For the great figure of the sun god at the entrance to the harbor of Rome, the Colossus, only stood for 56 years. Therefore, there was only this brief period in which you could see all of these marbles. But the ruins and remains of them were visible for long periods of time so that even these ruins came to be regarded as worthy of special travel and perhaps even hazardous adventure in order to see them. Actually, it would appear that these seven wonders were utterly unrelated. They were built at different times by different people for different purposes. Yet as we classify them and arrange them, it appears also that a pattern is traceable. And from the old opinion record comes the conviction that accidentally or intentionally the seven wonders formed a kind of miniature solar system that these monuments actually did not overlap in their meanings and purposes. And though built by entirely different groups, they formed a complementary arrangement, actually sacred to the seven planets recognized by the ancients. Now it is quite possible that within the structure of a people, a rather closely knit cultural group, as we know at that time, that these monuments were archetypal symbols. They represented one of the earliest expressions of man's instinct to externalize concepts and ideas within himself. There have been waves and levels of this process of externalization. And we're going to try to follow the various levels by comparing one group of production with another. If we may assume, therefore, that as archetypal dreams arise within man, and these dreams take on symbolic forms, that the great accumulation of structures known as the Seven Wonders actually represents a sevenfold symbolic dream coming forth out of man at an early age of his culture and having a real and deep meaning that survives in the life of modern man. Even today, under certain psychic intensities, the individual will have archetypal and architectural dreams. He will see temples and palaces and monuments and towers 
even as symbolic of his own psychic nature. And it is quite conceivable that the psychic or folk pressure of man at one time produced this tremendous monument building intensity. It is diffused throughout the world. There is no part of the earth in which men have not raised monuments to various abstract ideas. These monuments being actually their own symbolic vestments which they have given to principles or beliefs or concepts which they regarded as important. Everywhere, therefore, we find the ruins and remains of ingenuity, of great structural intensity. We find them in Egypt, and we also recognize the great monolithic monuments of the Druidic period of Britain and Gaul. We find these monuments in China, in India, Persia, and all other foreign ancient peoples. There are traces of them, in fact, almost more than traces, in our North American culture, and in the Central American and Southern part of our hemisphere, there were magnificent architectural achievements bearing witness to some kind of a forming pressure in man. Thus architecture comes very close to archetypes, and nearly all archetypes as concepts within man have their architectural expression through the great basic arts and sciences which also arise within the individual. So I made a little list here of a number of parallels concerning uh, these pressures in man, relating them to the original group of monuments and extending the pattern through the ages to represent man's moral and ethical growth. And perhaps we do have here some key or some clue to something of value. Now, of course, after we leave the ancient monuments, uh, which are held in common esteem, we enter a controversial series of patterns. In preparing later septenaries, many different structures could be selected. It would not be necessary to select merely the ones which I have more or less chosen. On the other hand, whether we select differently or not, we are selecting from the same fields of human activity. We may choose one building as more significant than another, but the tremendous symbolic pressure behind the concept of monuments remains regardless of the particular choice. We may also advance different branches of learning, uh, but if these be correctly advanced, they seem to form a basic pattern, indicating how man operates from within his own nature. And as the patterns continue on down to the most contemporary activities of man, it seems that they may have some definite value for us. Now, the original group of ancient monuments were unquestionably de uh, dedicated to various deities or to the attributes of deities as represented in the heroic achievements of human beings. The first of the great monuments in its natural concept order would be the Colossus of Rome. This is the figure that stood at the entrance to the harbor of the city of Rhodes in ancient times, existing and standing for some 56 years, and afterwards having fallen, remaining as a fallen wonder for several hundred years. This figure was 106 feet in height composed of brass overlaid with gold. It was a symbol and form of the sun god, and one hand was raised holding up a torch which lighted the entrance to the harbor. That has been the old story that the feet of the image were placed on each side of the harbor on a pedestal, so that ships entered the harbor between the feet 
This, however, is most unlikely. All the older records seem to imply that it merely stood at the entrance of the harbor. The only um, likenesses that may be regarded as authentic of many of these marvels will be found upon early coinage. And the coinage of Rhodes at the period of the Colossus show the head of the image surrounded by a nimbus of solar rays. That this deity or this sun god was a monument to the solar deity cannot be doubted. Therefore, we start our series or sequence of uh, images and monuments sacred to the planet. There could be no doubt about the first of these. Later, the great confederation of communities and cities uh, that worshiped the deity Diana resolved to unite together and form a common center of worship. Ephesus was selected for the site of this great temple, and the several states united to construct the second of the great wonders, namely the temple of Diana at Ephesus. This is regarded as one of the most beautiful monuments ever created on a religious level. It not only represented the adoration of Diana, the goddess of the moon, it represented an early effort at adoration through union, through the coming together of different people and the creation of a sanctified ground in which many persons of different political groups could unite in the worship of their deity. This building was destroyed by vandalism, and uh, it is said that it was brought to ruin by a madman who conceived that if he burned this temple, he could never be forgotten by history. He, uh, his villainy would make him immortal. It has done so, because he has been remembered, but always uh, with a certain bitterness, because he destroyed so noble and beautiful a structure for no valid or important reason. The third monument that we should mention was created by the artist Phidias. After his exile from Athens, he went to Olympia, and here he created his great figure of the Olympian Zeus, the largest and most impressive of the religious figures of ancient Greek worship. This Zeus or, uh, was a seated figure within a great temple and carried in one hand a scepter and in the other hand a globe surmounted by the figure of Minerva or Athena. The figure was composed of some unknown substance, perhaps metal, perhaps stone, but it was overlaid over the robes with pounded gold and the face and hands and exposed parts were made of ivory. It was a magnificent achievement in the art world, and by the name of it, and by the very circumstances, it is obvious that it was intended to represent Jupiter, one of the great family of planets, one of the great gods. And it is interesting that in these seven wonders, there are no two dedicated to the same deity or to the same concept. Therefore, the evidence that some pattern, organization, or order was beneath the grand conception. How such a pattern could have come into existence might seem strange to us. But in those days, the creation of monuments uh, was restricted to a group. There was a group called the Dionysian Artificers. They were the initiate priest artisans of the temple of architecture. They were set aside by obligations and oaths. They were bound to secret knowledge and law. And regardless of who employed them, it seems that the idea for the seven wonders must have originated among such a group. And as this group extended its influence throughout all the areas where these monuments stand, it is quite possible that they were the organizing power which brought these monuments together into a pattern. 
and that they had resolved to glorify the universe. And as various commandments or commissions came to them to build, they introduced the necessary symbolism, perhaps without even the knowledge of those who commissioned the buildings. It is very possible that the entire procedure was due to this group of initiate builders. The next monument is said to have been dedicated to the deity Saturn, and this was the Pharos of Alexandria, the great lighthouse that stood at the entrance to the harbor of the city of Alexandria in North Africa. The Pharos was a wonderful structure over 600 feet in height and composed entirely of white marble. It stood for quite a long time and the ruin of it was visible as late as the 14th century of the Christian era. It had at the top an arrangement for the building of great signal fires in order that ships at sea a long way off could see the fire burning on the top of this column and be led to safety. Therefore, the Pharos was actually a lighthouse, and it was the, one of the earliest examples of this type of construction. It is remembered also uh, that during the Roman uh, wars in Egypt, uh, this uh, Pharos was at one time the refuge of Julius Caesar. It was a wonderful structure, and because it was the tallest, and rose in the most impressive spire. The ancients declared that it was associated with the deity Saturn. Another tremendous and magnificent architectural uh, endeavor was the creation of the great Babylonian gardens. These are supposed to have been ordered and designed in connection with the symbolism of Semiramis, Queen of Babylon. Actually, we know now that this queen was an embodiment or personification, uh, at least in symbolism, of the concept of the planet Venus. It was a great symbol of beauty and of artistry and of the, uh, the glory of creative idealism. Semiramis has been very difficult to trace historically as a queen. She becomes practically a mythological person, and as a mythological person was an extension of the power of Venus. These gardens consisted of a great pyramidal structure rising in levels or stages, each of the levels magnificently planted with all kinds of rare and glorious flowers and trees and things of that nature. And on the very top level of the pyramid was an enormous reservoir which was used to collect the water necessary to water the entire garden. It was a beautiful example of man's earliest concept of horticultural and botanical accumulation. It was also involved in science and was important on a scientific level because it brought knowledge of the growth of plants and trees and shrubs from all parts of the world that were gathered there and also used to increase the medicinal knowledge that men had of the use of plants and things of that nature. The hanging gardens, so-called, of Babylonia are therefore considered among the great wonders of the world. Now we should pause a moment in connection with the, and uh, go back to the Pharos of Alexandria, the great lighthouse, because this is an alternative to one other monument that is said to have been of equal value or significance to the standpoint of planetary rulership. It being held by some writers that instead of the great lighthouse of Alexandria, uh, this concept of the deity Saturn rightly, rightly belongs to Solomon's temple. So this has been considered as an alternative, the great temple complex uh, on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. The te Temple of Solomon was not a great structure in itself, but the enormous platforms upon which it stood, the tremendous architectural skill of the builders in arranging the buildings surrounding the temple and setting forth the entire complex in the pattern of the ancient Jewish religion, uh, caused 
These endeavors and achievements caused the building to be regarded as an alternative, and uh, in some lists it takes the place of the Pharos of Alexandria. Now the next uh, structure that comes naturally to us is the magnificent tomb of King Mausolus. This is so-called the Mausoleum at Halicarnassus. Uh, this uh, word, mausoleum, from the king mausoleus, is now the root of our common term, mausoleum, as a name for a place for the reposing of the remains of honored dead. Uh, this uh, great king was a magnificent warrior. He did a great deal to unite and bind together his people. He was an astute leader and his tomb is said to be a monument to the planet Mars as being the monument to the warrior in the group we have mentioned. This structure was a large cubical structure with extensions and uh, towers and surmounting the roof of it was also a pyramid and on the top of this pyramid a magnificent golden statue of King Mausolus. Uh, this uh, structure has uh, disappeared. We have no actual trustworthy representations of it. Uh, but from the ancient report, a reasonable reconstruction is possible. The next and last of these wonders, then, is that which relates to the planet Mercury. And all Egypt and other nations agree that this uh, wonder belongs primarily uh, by right to the great complex of pyramids at Giza, particularly the Great Pyramid, and that this was a monument to the God of wisdom, to the God of knowledge and the God of letters, that it actually represented the entire epitome of ancient learning, for into it were built the principles of the known arts and sciences of the day. It was therefore sanctified to the messenger of the gods, to the mysterious winged deity Hermes. If we consider this group then, we observe that we have a pattern, a very well-defined, organized group of symbols, that they form a kind of cluster. And while, of course, in ancient times there was much travel necessary between them, in their, if we look at them from today, uh, they are only in a comparatively small region uh, brought together with an amazing amount of ingenuity. Now, there were other great buildings of the old world, but they have never seriously competed with these. These constitute uh, a set apart and that they should have been so selected in the presence of such other possibilities as the Roman Forum or the Circus Maximus or the Colosseum or the Acropolis at Athens or other tremendous achievements, that these should not be included, but only the seven wonders and bound to the very important number seven seems to indicate that there was an intent and a purpose behind this selection. Now, there's one point in this that I think we should also bear in mind, namely that all of these wonders represent actually architectural or art achievements. They really do not give to us a full understanding in themselves of the achievements of antiquity. They do tell us beyond all doubt and question that the people producing these monuments were highly advanced in many arts and sciences. But when we look back upon antiquity, we are rather too prone to look back upon monuments, rather than to look back upon the more living uh, memorials that descend to us through the achievements of people. Therefore, paralleling these seven with equivalents derived from the intellectual and moral life of man, we come to another great group of uh, contributions by which antiquity is remembered. Monuments that stand perhaps even more powerfully than the symbolic shrines that we have described. 
So I made a list here of some of the other contributions in relationship to the seven wonders. So we can take this particular group. We can parallel the seven wonders with seven forms of learning to which we are peculiarly indebted to antiquity. As the most obvious and direct reference to the planet and to the luminaries is found in the Colossus of Rome, which was the sun god. We can also find that we can parallel this statue with a great science that came down from the past, namely the science of astronomy. The Colossus of Rhodes gives us an archetypal concept of astronomy. By its structure and by its uh, integration, the temple of Diana of Ephesus, the lunar temple, parallels music. The great Phidian figure of Zeus, the uh, Zeus of Olympus, under the planet Jupiter, gives us the archetypal structure of law as uh, jurisprudence or legislation. The Pharos of Alexandria, the great lighthouse of Saturn, the great, the tallest and the most illuminating of all the monuments, mathematics, the mother of sciences, the beginning of organized knowledge. Outstanding in the, the system also, uh, the uh, temple or memorial of King Mausolus, the mausoleum of Halicarnassus, under the rulership of Mars, ties to the principle of architecture, and the hammering and cutting and chiseling of stone. Uh, the uh, marvelous structure of the hanging gardens of Babylonia, bind with the concept of art, and the pyramid ruled over by Hermes with his caduceus, reminds us also of another great art of the ancient medicine. So out of antiquity, we have secured not only these ruined physical monuments, but we have also received psychological monuments, monuments upon which we have built as foundations. But we are indebted to and dependent upon the skill of ancient man for the foundations of all sciences and arts known today. So the seven great arts and sciences of the ancients, astronomy, music, law, mathematics, architecture, art, and medicine, constitute another heritage out of the past, a heritage of enduring uh, human achievement. Now we also know that the ancients gave us not only this concept of sciences and arts, but a directive in connection with the use of them. We realize that they represented these arts as having been bestowed by deities for the purpose of assisting humanity to achieve its birthright, and that in ancient times all sciences and arts were dedicated to the service of deities, and consequently the artisan was also a priest, one in whose life and nature a great gratitude, a wonderful thankfulness, and a wonderful humility is shared with knowledge in dominating his concept. Therefore, astronomy was more than the mere study of the visible heavens. It was the study of the anatomy and physiology of God, the discovery of the tremendous universal mystery whose body nature is and God the soul. Therefore, with reverence, the sciences were advanced. Music was the art which gave man the concept of universal harmony. It had to do with order and integration. It had to do with vibration, whether the ancient was fully aware of the term or not. He worshipped through music. He grew through music. He felt the tremendous importance of this harmonic structure of sound, and he dedicated it to the service of his God and to the various rituals and rites and ceremonies of religion. Gradually we have come to secularize most of these branches of learning, 
But even today, of course, music is closely related to religion. And sacred music is among the greatest of our musical compositions. The next concept that we have is law. This law which was originally the will of the gods for their creatures. Law embodied in the great person of Zeus, the, uh, arch, the arch deity, the cosmocrator, the father of gods and men. Zeus with his thunderbolt, punishing the lawbreaker and opening the gates of the Imperium uh, gloriously and majestically to the law keeper. That the universe was an orderly thing, that the conduct of men must be orderly relationships, and that the individual who breaks the law of human integration must ultimately suffer. And law and punishment came down to us, and from the earliest days men sought to understand those regulations and rules by which their common conduct uh, was best expressed, and how they might live together in the most concord and with the greatest understanding, peace, and beauty of relationship. The symbol of law, of course, was Jupiter, and uh, the Roman law was dedicated to him. Uh, the Pharos of Alexandria, or Solomon's Temple, represented to the ancients the concepts of mathematics. Mathematics, the great power that lighted men, that brought all minds in from the sea of doubt and insecurity into the safe harbor of learning. Of all the ancient Saturn, or Cronus, was the father of gods and the father of time. Cronus was the principle of number, of the order and sequences of numerical speculation. And under Cronus was exactitude, the exact experience of mathematics, not merely the adding up of your grocery bill or the various uh, daily uses that we make of number, but the great concept of a universal exactitude, that numbers are instruments of magic and that by means of them, men can unlock all the wonders of the world. And as Saturn was the most ancient of the gods, so mathematics was regarded as the most ancient and basic of all arts and sciences. For without mathematics, none of the others can exist. But mathematics can exist without them. Therefore, that which is independent is superior. That which is dependent is inferior. And as all exact learning is based upon mathematics, it is the father of sciences, even as Saturn or Cronus was the father of deity. Thus the parallel is reasonably appropriate. To uh, the marvelous monument of Halicarnassus, the, uh, the uh, mausoleum, was assigned architecture because the records that we have of it indicate that it was the most perfectly integrated and perhaps architecturally uh, the supreme uh, member of the group. Emphasis here being placed upon architecture rather than upon uh, the uh, total concept. Everything was sacrificed to absolute architect architectural perfection of design. And we can only wish that some of these wonderful things had survived so that we could see them. But that the mausoleum became the symbol of all architecture. Architecture as temple to God. Architecture as tomb to the honored dead. Architecture as symbol of statesmanship, of power, authority, and of the government of people. Architecture stepping in to house all the other instruments. Were all, was also a reminder that architecture was a dynamic making possible all bodies in which life may be incarnated. And that finally also, these bodies, like temples and shrines, must be destroyed or must collapse or must disappear away so that all bodies that become glorious monuments must ultimately also become tombs. The next of the great arts represented by the hanging gardens of Babylon were what we would call today the art concept itself. 
in this case involving sculpturing, painting, the dance, art forms as we know them, poetry, because this great monument to Venus was dedicated to beauty, and supreme among all other arts was the art of living. And all arts are intended for one purpose, namely to make living beautiful, to make it possible for the individual to live not only efficiently and rationally, but with a grace, with a certain overtone of beauty by which life is enriched and by which all utilities are justified. Labor without idealism is without reward, and very few persons have ever achieved greatly unless there was beauty in them by which their labors were dedicated to some end greater than the mere gratification of ambition. Where such inner beauty does not exist, ambition leads only to tyranny and despotism. And the last of these, the Great Pyramid, under Mercury, tells us, of course, of the art of medicine, of healing, and of the power of the gods to bring health to the bodies of men. Anciently, medicine was part of religion, and Hermes was the physician of souls. For medicine not only to the ancients was a remedy for the body, but the greatest of all medicine was wisdom, which was the medicine for the sickness of the soul. And if the soul was sick, the body could not be well. But if the, in the case of sickness the soul could be restored, then there was greater probability that the body would recover. Already in ancient times man had conceived the psychological relationship between right attitude, right knowledge, right thinking, and the state of the corporeal nature of man. Therefore that the sound body must be inhabited for the same mind. And Mercury, as taking away ignorance, took away the great sickness for which learning is the only remedy. Thus these uh, concepts broaden the foundation of our indebtedness to ancient people and tell us something more of the uh, expanding of our way of life. Now the thought came to me that it might be interesting uh, to return for a moment to the level of architecture. We are rather proud today of the things we do, or perhaps not only just the things we do, but the things that have been done. We also remember that in the collecting of the original group of seven wonders, man was comparatively unaware of that part of the world which was far from him, particularly the great structure of Asia. He had no knowledge that there were other worlds and other parts of this world far from his own abode. And in Asia and in other European and even in American architecture and structure, we have likewise wonders, wonders that are very important and interesting. So I've collected a group, others can change it, but again this group carries through to the original pattern of wonders which we can visit today. A few cases we may have to wait for more auspicious political situations, but the monument still stands and are available to us, and most of them we can visit. Strangely, we have more or less picked them out ourselves, and nearly every tourist guide, nearly every fragment of literature about foreign countries features these features them perhaps as ancient man instinctively selected the old wonders. And in arranging them we find they make very much of a pattern, because they are not so different from the group that we originally uh, had. We remember the Colossus of Rome, standing with torch arrays at the entrance of the city of Rome. We can hardly miss the analogy to the Statue of Liberty, which also stands with torch rays facing the sea, just as in the case of ancient Rome, and is certainly to be included among the wonders of modern architecture. A monument to liberty, as the older one was a monument to life. 
and to us liberty and right are very closely involved. The great sanctuary of the ancient world, the one uh, where the peoples came from everywhere to pay tribute and to enrich the shrine of the great lunar deity, mother of mysteries, Diana, goddess of the Ephesians, the mother of life, the marvelous principle in which, in which the ancients recognized the mother who was forever a virgin. And this was the temple of Diana. And it does not take a great deal of imagination to conceive its parallel in the greatest religious monument of the modern world, the Vatican at Rome, dedicated also very largely to the mother of mysteries dedicated to the world virgin, and of course adorned and decorated as was the temple of Diana, with the wealth and treasures of countless peoples. The tremendous architectural achievement of the Vatican is undeniable, and the magnificent accumulation of treasure there is almost the same as we hear in the description of the great temple of Diana at Ephesus. Now we are looking always for Zeus or Jupiter, uh, as the ancients said, to bring us a great mass and weight. And at the very moment of its dedication, uh, the planet Jupiter ruled the, one of the greatest structures of modern engineering, and that is the Empire State Building in New York, which was dedicated by the then governor, Alfred Smith, at the very moment of the dignification of the planet Jupiter. It became the symbol almost of our whole way of life, for everything we do has to be bigger. It may not always be better, but it will be bigger. And, our, and this tremendous monument of modern uh, industry, this tremendous symbol of modern architectural efficiency, uh, the largest and highest of our achievements, uh, the, the concept of the Empire State Building as a wonder of the modern world is not unreasonable. Then we think of the great temple of uh, Saturn, the Saros or White House of Alexandria, and we remember the consternation caused in the last century by the tower that no one believed could be created, and which once created, no one believed anyone would ever understand and that is the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Still a symbol of man's early engineering skill and one of the most ambitious and incredible achievements of its own time. We then find another important uh, concept. The mausoleum of Heliconassus was under Mars. What is the great mausoleum or the great architectural monument today that parallels it? Possibly, we could select the Washington Monument, which probably represents the most ambitious uh, work of its kind uh, of the modern world. Two monuments to soldiers, two monuments uh, to the remembrance of persons who brought forth order out of chaos, created new nations, and brought states together in an important federation to be ruled over with wisdom and prudence. The next thought that we have is that nothing resembling the gardens of Semiramis remain. Yet this mysterious queen of Babylonia, whose symbolism, of course, was related to the planet Venus, suggests to us the greatest monument to heroic womanhood in the world today, the Taj Mahal at Agra. The great, the mystery of love in stone and marble as it was created in India, in honor of a great queen, in honor of a wonderful woman, in honor of a remarkable career and dedication, and is said to be Asia's great contribution to the concept of world womanhood, appropriately under the symbolism of Venus. Now, for Mercury, we can also have something that travels and moves and does all kinds of strange and wonderful things, and we placed under it the most massive and enduring of the ancient marbles. This marble was the Pyramid of Giza. What is the largest, vastest, 
uh, most inconceivable surviving evidence of man's handicraft. It does not belong particularly to recent times, but it still survives, therefore it comes under our heading. And the answer, of course, is the wall of China. This wall, she created by men, and incidentally largely by scholars, because it represented the greatest persecution of learning the world has ever known. But this immense wall, 25 feet high, 50 feet thick, and 2,500 miles long. This is without question man's vastest architectural achievement. And every little distance along the wall, great towers rising, gates, and a complex of structure that stretches like ribbon over mountains and into valleys, over cliffs and into depressions, boundary and empire, created to keep the enemy out, but like all exclusiveness, serving only to keep the friend locked in. There was no relief, no achievement of this particular uh, wall. It was a complete failure, but one of the greatest achievements in itself of the skill of human life. So vast that most Chinese living along the wall today do not believe that human beings built it. It had to have been built by divine agency. And although it was built and constructed about the time of the Christian era, there is also a note of science in it, because on, over one of these gates is a proclamation stating that it was built under a certain emperor, who, by the way, was the persecutor of learning, and that this emperor had caused a wall to be built around his empire, one-tenth the circumference of the earth. So that at the time it was built, 2,500 miles long, the ancients had the concept that the world uh, was 25,000 miles in diameter, which is not very far from the facts. Now out of the development of our own time, we have also created wonders. And the question arises in our thinking, what are the wonders which we have fashioned? Now, we have many that we can select from, but let us see whether these in any way can be regarded as paralleling psychologically the implications and inferences of the older concept. What are the great wonders of the modern world? Not structure, but wonders that we have perfected, that perhaps having arisen from older sources, we have so largely and greatly transformed that they no longer bear a distinct relationship to the older sources. We have the Colossus of Rhodes, for example, and we cannot make all the parallels, but we will make one or two to show the way my thinking has been on the subject. We have the Colossus of Rhodes, bound to the concept of astronomy, bound to the concept of liberty by the Statue of Liberty, and what do we have out of this? The torch held up. What does it bring to our mind in modern development? Perhaps the, one of the key discoveries or contributions of modern times, the electric light. Here we have the beginning of the development of a modification which was to, was to change the entire life of the race. So the symbol of light finally comes down to us as the principle of physical illumination. The uh, development of certain essential concepts relating to uh, a whole variety of extensions, the power of the electric light to transform habits, practices, policies, and to make available to man a life at night a life apart from the life of earlier man, a life which also gives to him illumined leisure if he wishes to so use it, depending on his own instinct. And from the moon, and from Ephesus, and the ancient symbols of the lunar goddess, imagination, imagio, we have perhaps another great shadow 
casting power of modern thinking, the motion picture. For the moon was strangely the symbol of mist and mystery, was strangely the sign of shadows and reflections, a world of things of appearance, deriving its light not from itself but from the sovereign sun. So it was a reflector, or a secondary source of light, and perhaps suggests to us the effect of the motion picture upon the entire life of man. And then, of course, what have we to correspond to the magnitude of things? The magnitude of Zeus, of law, the empire state building, these things that must always be greater and bigger. And perhaps as we look at the thunderbolts in the hand of Zeus, we can be reminded of the development of our atomic and electronic sciences and arts. The rise of a great system which can, under loving and intelligent skill, become a wonderful servant of mankind but certainly one of the stupendous achievements of modern man. Now Saturn, representing the ancient principle of mathematics and the lighthouse that guides the, the Turafal or Eiffel Tower, and the development of a certain concept, a concept of bringing a certain kind of light to man, may be paralleled by a department of knowledge which has been always associated by the medieval people with the deity Saturn, and that is the invention of printing. Printing is one of the most powerful forces known to modern man, not available to the ancients. By means of printing, the world of the mind has opened as it could not in any other way be opened. It has produced the diffusion of knowledge. It has made available to the individual the inherited wisdom of his species and his kind. It is a mighty tower rising to carry upon its top the blazing symbol of enlightenment. And the use of the tower depends upon the flame at the top, and the value of printing depends upon the quality of that which is printed. For Mars, representing the mausoleum of Halicarnassus and many other parallel symbols, we can think of another very important field of research that has been open to man, and that is the development and discovery of the X-ray. Here we have a possible means of solving problems, a means as yet hazardous, a means as yet uncertain, but giving us a powerful instrument uh, for the assistance of the human being under many conditions. And of course, X-ray can extend into other fields than that of therapy and becomes important, directly or indirectly, in many phases of our activity. Under Venus comes the possibility of a larger life, a possibility of bringing to the individual uh, the beauties and wonders of the world, so that the whole earth can become a kind of hanging garden, and every man is a tourist. And this is the development and, and advancement of our great systems of transportation. Transportation has now been elevated to the point uh, whereby the automobile, the aeroplane, and other devices the world becomes available and accessible to all of us. Transportation has done a great deal to deform, but also to beautify the world in which we live. It makes it possible in many cases today for every man to have his garden, to have his own world of flowers and beauty, because he is able to travel further between his business and his home. It makes it possible for him to go out and see his country or see his world. And if they ever get the signboards down, we'll see it better. We now have the whole world thinking about a one world policy. We have selfishness, we have greed, we have intolerance with us still. But these things are passing further and further out of fashion. The individual who exhibits these tendencies is no longer respected as the outstanding citizen. What is respected now 
is a constructive, hoped-for understanding of mankind. Therefore, it would seem to me that this vision, supported by vast economic structure, actually receiving the major uh, cooperation of many peoples and many levels of integration, that this organized concept of world peace is one of the wonders of the modern world. It is something long overdue, but gradually coming to be done. And by it we are divided from ancient man, who may have had the dream, but had not the ability or the perspective necessary to bring this dream into objective manifestation. We have brought the dream into the world of realities as we know them, material, intellectual realities, and we are fighting to make it work. We are struggling to bring this concept to maturity. Now we have the moon, Diana of Ephesus, music, the Vatican motion pictures. Here is the entire lunar pattern. And what have we today achieved as our great offering to the Lady of the Mysteries? I think the thing we have to offer is something that is paralleling, whether we realize it or not, the labors of world peace. We are merging into a gradual concept, which is now a birthright, the concept of interreligious tolerance. The possibility of religions meeting as such. The gradual emergence of man's instinct to comparative religion. Uh, the emerging of the instinct to recognize that other faiths have a right to exist. The moving away from the exclusiveness of a religious position to its increasing inclusiveness as exemplified by the recent series of articles in Life magazine and many other articles being published constantly, pointing to the possibility of the faiths of men becoming a basis of unity between peoples rather than a constant source of disunities. The ancient world, Pythagoras knew this unity, others have known it also. But today we see the actual machinery of unity moving into action. And we, abhor, we behold the mystery of man's greater kindliness toward religion. And with these passing years, a greater willingness to explore and examine the building of bridges between faiths and all of these principles have much to do with the hope of our future. And here is another wonder that has emerged from man, part of the archetypal pattern that had to come forth in the course of ages. Now our great deity Zeus, in, uh, personifying Jupiter and law, tied up with the great architectural achievements, also tied into the development of atomics, brings us face to face with the great development of the concept of Zeus, namely the concept of administration. And here we have come to another tremendous step, namely constitutional democracy and universal suffrage. These things existed in small fragmentary areas in the past, but never before have we seen the concept of the rights of man developed and unfolded as in the last 300 years of our world existence. Here we have the concept of government by the people, for the people, and of the people. We have a tremendous group under a certain amount of pressure today, it is true, but still this pressure, even in itself being asserted by other groups, in whose actual existence socialized principles are also present, although perhaps at the moment disfigured. But the great motion toward the right of the human being, the great motion of the political equity of peoples, the rise and recognition of the right of all men to their place in the sun, their opportunity to, uh, to direct 
or to share in the administration of their own destinies. This tremendous concept of workable political democracy under many names, but giving to the people liberties and equalities unknown in ancient times, is also a tremendous ethical step forward. We know that the Pharos of Alexandria, under Saturn, the symbol of the Old One, Mathematics, the Eiffel Tower of Printing. We have all these different levels. And then we have this concept of Saturn, concept of the aged, coming forward to us in another great development that has come to us in many cases in the memory of the living. And that is the rise of the whole pattern of the security of man in his advancing years. Old age security of various kinds, endowments, insurance, and even national intervention, the gradual development of a protective economics for the old, a gradual recognition of the right of the individual to the dignities of existence, a right ignored by most of antiquity. This gradual protective mechanism, with its faults, with its mistakes, but with its great hope behind it, has emerged and is fighting its way toward gradual integration and rationalization. We have the advantage over what was the absence of our present attainment. We have yet far to go, but the gradual development of security, security for the young, security for the unemployed, security for the aged, these things are here and they are here to stay and they are here to grow and to develop, and they represent a tremendous thing which in terms of the ordinary probabilities of, of life uh, is what, little less than a wonder, something that is almost inconceivable in the light of ancient ways, but to us is becoming familiar and generally acceptable. Then we have under Mars, Various developments, symbols, developments from the ancient mausoleum of Heliconassus, and we then have another concept, the fight through to what we know today as universal education. The power of universal education is something uh, that is to be reckoned with. Uh, not more than a hundred or a hundred and fifty years ago, the majority of human beings were born into this world with a conviction that they must remain illiterate. And while today we still have a great deal of illiteracy, more than we realize, still the struggle toward universal education, the extending of the privileges of education into the most remote, remote parts of the world, this struggle goes on, moved and fired and impelled by something within man himself this tremendous dynamic to correct the weaknesses which he is discovering in the social structure around him. He is realizing more and more that his own security as an educated person depends upon the fact that other persons are educated. That we cannot have world peace, we cannot have world health until ignorance in far places is overcome. We are also under tremendous pressures to determine the essential nature of education, to recognize the need for reform and change within the structure of it. But regardless of these changes that must come, and they will come also out of this same pressure within man, we have made an achievement which would have been incredible to antiquity, namely that we have advanced education until it is no longer limited to classes, that it is no longer limited to groups or levels, but that a certain amount of education in our Western way of life is now compulsory, and that the individual is destined and inevitably foreordained to have a knowledge as his common birthright, which would have been the admiration of his ancestors. Actually, in the Middle Ages, kings could not write. Princes could not read, and the average person had no knowledge of even the simplest mathematical formulas. He could not even add or use the multiplication table. 
Thus it is important uh, to realize that in a short time this has been transformed, not in the terms of 10,000 years, but in the terms of 500 years. Man has greatly and wonderfully advanced his abilities and created a concept in himself which he must live up to. And it is this group of concepts with which we are primarily concerned at, uh, concerned at this moment. Under Venus, the hanging gardens of Babylon and the wonderful reservoirs for the watering of these gardens, comes something else. And that is the complete structure that we have today of public utilities and sanitation. Here again is something we have never known before in the history of the world. The lack of these facilities prevented the ancient world from developing cities. And it was not until Vitruvius created the aqueducts in Rome and designed the sewers that Rome could even begin to be a city. We also realize that as late as the 15th century, the average city of Europe had no sewers. That in the 17th and 18th century, London had no public sanitation. And up to very recently, of course, with the development of our principles of scientific knowledge, only very recently have public utilities uh, come into existence even as a concept. But these things have advanced our way of life in numerous regards. We are no longer decimated by the bubonic plague. We are not like Europe in the 13th century where 25 million died together in a few months. Nor we grew in Europe between the 13th and the 16th century where in 300 years two-thirds of European civilization died of plague. We have gradually cleared many of these problems. And the entire concept of bringing to man a knowledge involving the entire care of himself, a greater increasing scientific awareness of nutrition, of clothing, of sanitation, of hygiene, of eugenics, all of these things have come to man as a birthright in our day. But they are things totally unknown to man of long ago. A few, perhaps, brilliant individuals discovered for themselves. An occasional person may have come under strong influence and become informed. But the body of, the, of society was without these advantages, without this knowledge, and therefore subject to numerous infirmities that we do not know. Let us not forget also, of course, that we are subject to infirmities they did not know. But the great picture, the concept, of man's development of his public utilities and sanitation principles represents, this concept represents a great step forward, a step forward which will mature and ripen in due course with many other activities. And under Mercury comes the, the seventh of these principles which we wish to bring to your attention. And this is something which is a highly controversial subject, but which in time, must mature itself for our very serious consideration. And that is that in the modern world, under Mercury, we have produced the organization of labor. The organization of labor is far more important than we realize. For until man was able to socialize and integrate his working concepts, his entire cultural life had to be sacrificed to the interminable processes of work and activity. The organization of labor is something that could never have occurred before. It has become the foundation of bringing leisure, bringing protection and security to three quarters of the people of democratic civilizations and political systems. It has made possible the gradual enlightenment and improvement of labor. It has brought labor into a recognition of leisure. It is gradually challenging labor to personal, individual self-improvement. The problem is still in a comparatively imperfect degree of development. But the power to organize, to protect the power of the individual, his earning capacities, his privileges as a human being, this power unknown to ancient man 
is perhaps somewhat overworked by modern man. We have gone to extremes, we have become too political, to this and to that, but the great principle of the right of the individual not to be exploited, the right of the individual to profit and share in the consequences of his own endeavors, these principles are right. And in time, these principles will find their right workings in our way of life. So here are seven great achievements which we have made. Achievements which have to do with the motions of time. These achievements apparently are very close as archetypal structures to the first glorification of the gods in the wonders of the ancient world. Each of these levels represents man thinking from a basic archetype, unfolding that archetype according to the skill and ability of his own consciousness and according to the opportunities and privileges of the times in which he has lived. But each individual going through life is bound into this archetypal concept. Each person has a dominant within his own nature. Perhaps he is potentially the mathematician, perhaps the artist, perhaps the musician. But we are all living on these rays that ride, that uh, ray out from this tremendous corona of the sun principle. Thus each person's contribution is determined by his own focus of attainments. This contribution principle lurks within him and presses him on. If he resists it, denies it, or is unable to recognize it of his own accord, archetypal symbolism usually moves in upon him. He dreams, he has experiences, he feels pressures, he is dissatisfied, he is not in the right place, he is not doing the things he wants to do or was intended to do. And when these symbolic pressures break through him, they break through in symbols that go back to antiquity. They break through in the primordial form of religion and philosophy. Therefore, the understanding of these forms will help him to imply or to apply and extend these symbols into their utilities, into their practical uses in his modern way of life. So each one of us is in a way a builder of wonders. Each one of us perhaps is attracted to one group of wonders perhaps is attracted to one of the divisions of the ethical achievements of mankind. Perhaps we are not sympathetic with all of them. Perhaps we feel that some of them are not what they should be. We are drawn to one and find it impossible to understand another. Yet actually within our natures we are likewise seeking equilibrium. And one of the reasons for tension and stress in human life is this inability to commonly appreciate the good in all things. While one thing seems good and another bad to us, while we can accept certain ideas but must reject others, there is stress and tension within our own natures. We are therefore searching for this solar principle representing, represented by leagues and assemblies and organizations by which all incompatibilities within our own consciousness can likewise be reconciled. Each individual in his own personality is searching for a league of nations, is seeking a league which will bind his notions together to form out of them a solid and unified ability to create and express. All divisions in society reflect divisions within man himself. And it is the useful and proper labor of each individual to bring together the seven powers of his own soul, represented by the seven monuments, to build these powers into a program of practical and purposeful endeavor, using these powers to improve the society around him, to bring harmony, peace, and understanding to his own soul, to enable him to dedicate his resources to the common good of his world, until individuals make these achievements, until they make these dedications, they cannot be happy. And if they are not happy, they cannot be healthy. And all substitutes, or all methods of evasion or avoidance, which sustain merely our natural indolence, these substitutes are not adequate. 
nor do they bring us the security and peace of mind which we seek. Out of this archetypal pattern of our race, which is the folk soul in which we all share, have come these testimonies to the possibilities and potentials of man. We are all enabled to build upon them. We have received the past as a heritage. We must bestow the present as a legacy. And it is our wonderful privilege to build upon all these concepts and to make use of all the acquired skills of our peoples to fashion the integration of our own lives and advance the integration of others. So perhaps out of the contemplation of these matters, something useful will come. It has occurred to me that it is an interesting uh, subject, one which suggests psychological analysis, suggests that we search more deeply in ourselves to find the ancient monuments a potential ability which we have, and upon these monuments to build new monuments, ethical, moral, and spiritual, by means of which our own integration and the happiness of our world can be advanced. If we do this, we may find that we have resources, that the ancient monuments are gone, but within ourselves the ancient foundations remain, for in every individual is the foundation upon which he can build and advance himself into the future of his own kind. And out of the past, we must build into the future. And with such archetypal thinking, perhaps we can be inspired to further self-analysis. Well, time's up.